5 p.m. we're going to um, begin the Senate Rules Committee. Uh, I think we have a, a light agenda today. It's not too heavy. So why don't we establish a quorum. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Senators Canella, <coughs> Leva, Leva here, Mitchell? Here. Mitchell here, Runner, DeLeon? Here. DeLeon's here. Okay. We've established a quorum. We know that uh, Mr. Canella is well on his way. He's presenting a measure right now as we speak. Uh, before we get into our agenda, I want to take a, a quick uh, uh, personal privilege. I want to introduce a, a group of, of youth that have come up all the way from Los Angeles, uh, La Causa uh, Youth Build, who have come up to to learn about you know uh, the capital and, and Sacramento. And we want to thank you and recognize you for coming up here. So thank you very much for coming up here today. And I know you have a bus to catch all the way down to Los Angeles at, at, at 2.30, so you can take this moment to soak up as much as, as, as you can right now. We're going to uh, uh, be in the process of confirming or not confirming, we don't know, you know, uh, the Secretary of Veteran Affairs, uh, that is Dr. Vito uh, Imbascaini. You know, did I pronounce it correctly? Imba Oh, it's Imbasiani, and I thought it was, we, we went before, we went between Imbasiani and Bascaini, you know, and then we know that you are a MD as well as a PhD as well too, but before we get to you, uh, no, actually we can get to you because we have no uh, bills, uh, referrals today, I want to bring up uh, Dr. Uh, Imbasiani, and uh, please come up. Why don't you introduce yourself, and if there's any uh, loved ones or friends that you'd like to uh, introduce, uh, by all means, and then uh, you can share a little about yourself, and then we'll go into questions and Thank answers. you. Thank you, uh, Senator, uh, all senators. Um, I do have an introduction to, uh, to make. Um, I have two boys that are in high school in Burbank, and that's exactly where they belong this afternoon. Um, <laughs> Um, so, but my husband is here, uh, George DeSalvo. Um, George is the uh, CFO of Kaiser Health Plan and Hospitals in Southern California. And we were married a few number of years ago by the former uh, Speaker of the Assembly, John Perez. Mm. So, I thank he you. He likes to marry people a lot. <laughs> <laughs> he has married a lot of folks. It's, 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 a, yeah. it's a side business it, he has. <laughs> Yeah, it, so it is, and I can. Or it can be an unhappy thing at times <laughs> later on. You know, I can, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> he is very good at it. Yeah. Uh, um, so good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. I come to you with almost 30 years as a practicing surgeon and 28 years in the medical corps, caring for the men and women of this state, both civilian and military. And to me, there's no greater calling than to help and serve those who have stood up to defend our country. I joined the military as a surgical intern at Yale, not because I had to, but because I wanted to. My father served as a Marine in World War II. I wanted to join the Marines also, but their doctors are actually in the Navy. And I don't really like ships, so I joined the Army. My first deployment was to Saudi Arabia during the first Gulf War. And it was that conflict that cemented my passion for serving the men and women of the armed forces. During that war, as you, many of you remember, the final Scud missile attack on American soldiers resulted in a direct hit on an Army Reserve unit from Pennsylvania that had only just arrived in country that day. As the only doctor on duty that night and the one closest to that disaster, I was the first responder, and along with four Army medics, attended to the more than 30 men and women who were killed in that attack. It was not until later that I learned that fully one-fifth of all the combat deaths of an entire American war had passed through my hands in the space of 90 minutes on that night. I tell you this story only because it was the defining moment for me, and it led to more than 28 years of voluntarily serving in the Medical Corps, 26 of them under Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and as the state surgeon of the California National Guard. I learned in that war, in that one night, that war does not discriminate. It doesn't care if you're black or white, male or female, gay or straight, Christian, Jew, or Muslim. It just destroys life. Because of that one incident and others over the years, I, in turn, am passionately dedicated to serving the men and women of our military. 
So when the governor called me to ask if I would be interested in serving as the secretary of the California Department of Veterans Affairs, I knew it wasn't because, only because I was a veteran, but because I was a doctor. I could have said no and stayed with my surgical practice at the Southern California Permanente Medical Group. I could have happily stayed in Los Angeles with my family and friends. But I chose not to because I saw in this job a challenge, a promise, an opportunity to continue to serve the men and women that have put on the uniform of the United States military. I saw this as a way to bring together all my training, my experiences and skills to lead an agency that has one of the most noble tasks of any government organization, serving veterans. So thank you once again for listening and for giving me this opportunity to serve. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Imbas uh, Siaini. I uh, appreciate very much you sharing uh, your story. What we're going to do right now is we're going to go to questions and answers, um, uh, commentaries from the members themselves. And uh, we'll start uh, with uh, Ms. Mitchell. We'll start with Ms. Mitchell. Dr. Bassiani, welcome. Hi. Senator we Mitchell. had the pleasure of meeting several months ago now, and I can't remember, the, I want to say the stand. And the it was a stand down in, stand down. in uh, Los Angeles in Los at the Angeles. convention center. Thank you very much. We had the opportunity to meet. Uh, I attended the stand down that first day and saw all the amazing resources that were pulled together for veterans. And we had a chance to talk and recognize and we'd meet each other again um, at your upcoming confirmation. And so welcome. I'm glad to see you. Um, I just have really a couple of questions, and it has to do with the pressing the ever-pressing issue of, of homeless veterans. A couple of questions. Um, uh, my staff member was struck, I was struck by uh, a statement you made in your interview with Rules Committee staff, and I would hope that you would elaborate on it. And that was you described the average homeless veteran who does not have any children as a white male in his 50s. And the typical homeless veteran who does have children is an African-American female in her 30s. And what I find striking about that uh, and challenging is how government often lags behind in developing programs um, to meet the current and most relevant need right. of a particular population. And so could you talk to me about that yeah, statistics those are, and, and, and what we're doing sure, based I was, on that new reality. Thank you. I was actually going <clears> to <throat> play a game with you, ask you all to close your eyes, and I was going to say the words homeless veteran mm -hmm. and see, ask you, you know, rhetorically, what image came to your mind? And it was probably an older white male, right? But it's really shocking. And we need, um, we need to know the demographics much better. Um, to understand how we can address uh, the entire spectrum of housing, not just emergency housing, sheltering, getting people off the street in an acute need, but then uh, the, along the progression of uh, supportive housing all the way up through home ownership. We don't have all of that information yet. We're in our VHHP program, the Veterans uh, Homeless, uh, excuse me, Housing and Homeless Prevention Program, which is the embodiment of Prop 41, we will obligate contractors and service supp um, suppliers to give us information on who it is that they are serving and how well those projects are working. Um, for example, well, we are only just finished the first funding year mm -hmm. of Prop 41. Mm -hmm. Last year, we gave out $63 million, 17 projects, 700 veterans will be housed. Tomorrow, uh, our sister agencies involved with housing and we will announce the second round of that. Um, that will be another 127 million, 27 projects all over the state. Uh, we'll house another 1,000 veterans. But the first unit has not yet been occupied, will not be until early 2017. And it's when those units will come online and the contractors can start giving us the information we need, right down to the county level. We can ask them, well, how many of them were single, childless white men, and how many of them were anything, African American, single fathers, Native Americans, LGBT, the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I guess my question, because what I've heard, that my first year uh, in the legislature, 
for Veterans Day. Uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass and I did a joint Veterans Day event together at Veterans Hall in Culver City fo focused on women. And a number of the painful takeaways for me um, that day was there were a number of women who came up to us after and whispered that they were homeless and would be sleeping in their cars that night. But what they talked about uh, was the, the lack of services for women, residential services for women with their children. Yes. That a number of the veterans' homes were for single men, typically, but not people and their families. Mm -hmm. So I'm assuming these new units will reflect the new reality of who our veterans are. And many of them are women oh, with their children. Exactly right. Well, there's, you, you, tap, you just touched on a number of things. First of all, we have a problem outreaching to women veterans uh, altogether. Some women veterans don't realize that they, they realize they're women, but they don't realize they're a veteran. I've had women tell us, well, I've never been shot at in war. Well, that doesn't define you as a veteran. So we have to develop um, better outreach. And my deputy secretary, Lindsay Sin, for women's, um, Women Veterans Outreach, is doing a Herculean job, mm -hmm. or I guess I picked the wrong guy. That was a male, but you get it. <laughs> um, uh, is doing a, a great job in, in reaching out uh, um, to better understand uh, who they are and what their needs are. So, did I answer your? You did. Thank you. One more question. So, uh, it's my understanding that Connecticut, the states of Connecticut and Virginia, have really achieved a functional end to veterans homelessness. Sure. I, at the request of the pro tem, went to Utah to look at their model around chronic homelessness. So, I'm I'm very interested in states who um, are getting it right. Uh, and looking at models. Um, and you mentioned that you thought they were successful successful because of collaboration and open communications between all levels of government and the private sector. Could you elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. I well, what learn what, what Connecticut, states. Virginia, and many other states do, um, well, what they do is actually embedded in our own VHHP program. Uh, they, um, they mandate collaboration between the entities. Um, and let's see. Um, they stress housing first, mm -hmm. right? You have to get the person off the street before you can do anything else. So the housing first model is now the national model. And then the insistence that there be wraparound services. And everyone needs to know what wraparound services are. Um, they are, the, the veteran might have drug and alcohol rehabilitation needs, needs on the job, needs um, employment training, needs educational training, needs all kinds of that kind of support. Mm -hmm. That's it. Now, Virginia, you know the size of Virginia. Cal uh, Connecticut, I went to Yale, I know Connecticut really well. Uh, it's the size of Los Angeles County, mm -hmm. right? So we divide the states into continuums of care in the veterans world. Uh, and that each continuum of care has a progression that tries to solve homelessness. It's like a ladder. Mm -hmm. There are 40 of these continuums in California. Connecticut only has three, Virginia mm -hmm. 16, right? Um, mm -hmm. they, uh, Connecticut had a, the problem of housing 300 homeless veterans, Virginia 1,600. Los Angeles, we've gotten our number of uh, homeless down from 18,000 to 11,300. California has 10% of all the veterans in the nation. Because of our weather and our wonderful people, we have 25% of the homeless veterans of the nation, most of them in Los Angeles. So it's a matter of scale. I get that. But, but, but the mechanics of how you go about doing it whatever the size may be, are similar, I would assume. Yeah, there are. And there, there are some challenges. These 40 um, continuums of care, mm -hmm. they were each encouraged um, by the federal VA to go out and um, develop their own electronic um, data tracking systems. Mm -hmm. So they each, in fact, all did that. Therefore, none of them can speak to each other. Mm -hmm. So um, my department, CalVet, along with uh, Housing and Community Development, we're um, collaborating and shopping around. There are off-the-shelf projects, uh, pr products very similar to Microsoft that would enable the continuums of care to, to speak to each other and not only to return to the federal government aggregated data that um, absolutely is meaningless mm -hmm. and nothing can be gotten out of, mm -hmm. but to disaggregate that housing data along the lines you were 
asking about mm -hmm. race, gender, age, mm -hmm. children, mm -hmm. at the, so that we can direct state housing policy for the homeless at the state level, mm -hmm. the regional level, and down to the county level. Amazing. We're on that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Good to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mitchell. Um, Ms. Leva. Thank you, Mr. Pro Tem. Good afternoon, Dr. Ambassiani. It was such a pleasure to meet with you uh, earlier this week, and I enjoyed talking to you about the Yauntville facility. Unfortunate that they need $67 million in repairs, but understandable is why, and I hope everyone would visit this facility because all of our veterans should live in such a beautiful setting. Um, I also enjoyed uh, talking to you about home loans and the veterans home loan program. I shared with you that, that the house that I grew up in that my parents still live in, my dad received um, with a dollar, one dollar down as a veteran. And how do we do a better job of making sure, because I think I even asked you if the program was still existed, mm -hmm. how do we do a better job of making sure our veterans know that that opportunity is available for them? Yeah, this is the, a, a, a very, very largely unsung program. Um, well, except to the 420, 3,000 veterans in California that have bought a home, often with no money down, often uh, these are people that probably would not have been able to secure a home loan. This program the, uh, that we administer, uh, CalVet's uh, uh, Farm and Home Loan, established in 1921, and we, uh, 423,000 loans, we have never ever once touched a single dollar of general fund money. 27 times this department has gone to the ballot, 27 times in 95 years the voters have approved the money, the, the, um, appro the authority for us to borrow the money. So how do we do this? Uh, and by the way, um, the last one passed with 68% on the ballot. The lowest it's ever gone was 61%. That's the love that Californians have for their veterans. Mm -hmm. We do it by a number of ways. Um, we um, we have the lowest foreclosure rate in the nation, one, a 0.39%. Better than Freddie Mac, better than Fannie Mae, better than every bank in California. We have that record except for four quarters, which isn't bad given the number of years we're in business. Um, we do it by being fiscally prudent. We have cut our staff in that division from 130 down to 60 by automating the online application process for a mortgage. Um, why, do we, why is our foreclosure rate so low? Any one of you in this room have a mortgage, you likely have a deed, uh, a deed of trust, mm -hmm. right? We don't give our veterans a deed of trust when they, bar when they buy a home from us. They get a contract of sale. The difference is, those of us that have deeds of trust, you fall under, especially after the mortgage debacle of 2008, 9, 10, you fall under um, Frank, the Dodd-Frank regulations, which make banks act very adversarially to people who fall behind in their mortgage. CalVet, when a vet gets in trouble paying his mortgage, we can stop the mortgage and work creative with, creatively with them, get them back on their feet, add time to the tail end of that mortgage. And we work them, we get them through that problem if they're willing to work with us. That's why our loan is, is so low. And when I said we didn't touch a single dollar of uh, general fund money, how do we do that? These are self-liquidating loans. When the, when the veterans repay their mortgage every month, that money retires the debt, okay? We have never won. Uh, when the market tanked in 2010, 11, uh, oh, okay, great, I thought it was something, <laughs> I, thought it was something I said. <laughs> Love you, thank you. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> when, when the market tanked, we have two sister agencies involved in housing funding. They both were forced to take federal bailout dollars and to suspend lending. We never stopped. We never took a dollar of outside money. This is a wonder, this is such a good program. I'm thinking of, of actual an ad campaign to I advertise to the veterans in this state. Now, we've got about $300 million left in, in borrowing authority, so we, we probably may need to ask for some more at this point. But remember, we never touch a dollar of general fund money. That's excellent, and I think the ad campaign is a really good idea. What do you see the role of the department, or what is the role of the department in helping veterans find jobs? 
Uh, yeah, this is interesting. A lot of federal dollars come down to the Calvets of the nation, mm -hmm. except for employment. Monies that go to help uh, on-the-job training and uh, apprenticeship programs flow federally through the Department of Labor to our own EDD in every state in the union except Texas. And mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out what, 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 how they did it. <laughs> uh, we figured that if the money had come to us, we would, we would be good stewards of it. As it, uh, as it is, we work very, very collaboratively with the, our own department, EDD department, um, uh, we have um, all kinds of collaborative meetings where employers meet workers, uh, on-the-job training, apprenticeships. I think we're doing a really, really good job on that. I think the number of vets looking for jobs is starting to go down. That's, that is very good news. Uh, thank you very much for your passion for our veterans. Let us know how, how I personally or how we as a Senate can help you. And uh, it was very nice meeting you, Dr. Thank Mosciani. you very much, Senator. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Leva. Uh, Dr. Mbassiani, yes. one of your paisans, Mr. Canella. <laughs> Senator, hi, nice Thank to you. meet you. Sorry Great. for my uh, tardiness. I had another, another uh, committee. Um, in the 2015-16 budget, the Department of Veterans Affairs was required to provide specific information on the quality of care at the veterans' homes to the legislature by December. Okay. I'll Specific information on the quality of care at the veterans' homes to the legislature by December 1st of 2015. What is the status of this report? And if it's not been submitted to the legislature, when can we expect it? A, re um, a report to the legislature on the quality of care. I, I, I'm familiar with a lot of reports, okay. but maybe not a specific one. But in general, uh, you know, our homes lost their five-star rating a number of years ago, and we've been struggling to get that back. And uh, how does one do that? So my, my, one of my largest challenges in this job, given the number of dollars and people in my department that work in the homes, is to bring them back at least to a four-star level within the next year. I can tell you that every one of the homes that's undergone either CMS or CDPH reviews to get certified in, or, in order to bill and to admit um, uh, licensed beds, skilled nursing people. We are passing every, from Fresno to West LA to Reading, Lancaster, all over the state. Every home is passing every survey, often with no deficiencies. Well, so this was apparently in response to a report titled, Improving Services to Those Who Served, Recommendations for Delivering High Quality Care in California's uh, Veterans Homes. And it was a in the 2015-16 budget. So if you're not aware of that, could you check on it for me? And we can, right. Back to us? I, so uh, what I'm do when I came into this job six months ago, I found eight wonderful homes, well, seven wonderful homes and one really, really in need of some special attention. But let's say eight great homes that were built at the legislator's request, five of them in the last six years, that were built independently of each other and almost independently of central administration. My task is to bring these homes from the 20th century into the 21st century. And I'm gonna do that by standardizing uh, everything from the delivery of care, and that includes an electronic medical record, pharmaceutical delivery systems, quality of care systems, through contracting and maintenance and, and everything across the board. There's gonna be one manual for nursing and pharmacy and what have you on every single desk of every home, and it's the same manual. So efficiency, um, I'm going to, um, with standardization, I'm starting to look at how the military and veterans code ties my hands on maximizing the revenue that I think we are entitled to. Um, we can talk more about that at some point. Um, and, oh, demographics, and this actually goes back to something that Senator Mitchell asked me about. I don't know what's coming. The World War II and Korean vets are dying off in great numbers, including in our homes. The Vietnam vets are taking out residents, but what follows them? The over <coughs> 65 population is, is going to burgeon. The, the Alzheimer's population is going to skyrocket. And the veterans of these last 25 years of war, the longest war in our history, they're going to come at us later in life because they can stay at home with VA aid and attendance dollars, state IHSS dollars, Bash vouchers. When they come to us, they have many more diagnoses. Many of them have either substance-related or related to their psychological or emotional traumas. 
come to us later in life needing a higher level of care. I don't know if our eight homes, the way they're presently physically constructed, is going to be the answer for when these young kids that are coming back now um, are going to come to us. So what I've done in the last two months is hire two, um, two experts in state policy, demography, and mental health policy making to assay, assay the state to help me figure out what do I need next to be prepared. Okay. That's great. Uh, this was Senator Rutter's question, so I don't have the same background, but if you could just please check on the report that was due on December 1st, 2015 and get that to Senator Runner, I would appreciate that. I, I, sure. Thank you very much. <laughs> Whatever that is, I will. <laughs> Explain why we don't have it, because you don't know about it. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Canella. Um, Mr. Uh, or Dr. Imbasiani, let, let me ask you this question, because it, it, it goes to a little bit what Ms. Mitchell was asking, the, what words. We're grappling with this issue of homelessness, and it's it's vexing, it's deep, it's complex. But specifically for veterans uh, here in California, what are the the significant 